November 2013. Ukraine President Yanukovych is presented a trade deal with the European Union, a deal which would presumably lead to economic prosperity and take Ukraine under the umbrella of Europe. A miracle didn't happen, and European Union leaders and Ukraine have, as expected, failed to sign an historic free trade deal after a last-minute U-turn from Kiev. Ukraine has not signed the association agreement with the EU after all. Ukraine refuses to sign the association agreement with the EU. But Yanukovych rejected their offer and eventually settled for a more economically favorable deal with Russia. This decision led to massive protests on the streets of Kiev's Independence Square, a place known to the people of Ukraine as Maidan. Nine years after Ukraine's pro-Western Orange Revolution, up to 100,000 people have staged Kiev's biggest protest ever since. Marching in defense of a European future for their country, they denounced the government's U-turn over EU integration. The crowd of around a thousand protesters were joined by the leader of the opposition, the reigning world boxing champion Vitaly Klitschko. He called on the demonstrators to maintain pressure on the government after it decided not to sign a major trade deal with the EU. Free world is with you. America is with you. I am with you. Protesters have set up a tent city in the capital, vowing to stay there until they get their way. More clashes in Ukraine's capital, Kiev. Police fired tear gas on demonstrators protesting against the government's decision to suspend trade talks with the EU. Riot police and angry demonstrators fought each other in front of government buildings as one group tried to break into the cabinet of ministers' offices. The protest was the biggest in Ukraine since the 2004 Orange Revolution. This is escalating rapidly and they're preparing for the worst. Ukrainian boxer and opposition leader Vitaly Klitschko met on Thursday with U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland in Kiev. Protesters are well armed. Others threw rocks, wielded baseball bats and metal rods. They were also using grenades, fireworks and Molotov cocktails against law enforcers. But we can report this evening that masked men carrying nationalistic flags have uh, pulled down a statue, a monumental Lenin, and uh, smashed it with sledgehammers. Violent clashes erupted in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, as more than 100,000 people protested against a government decision to delay an association deal with the EU. Chaos on the streets of Kiev after a short truce, rioters are again wrecking havoc. The crowd in Independence Square is now much angrier and much more militant than it was only a few weeks ago. Oh, this looks like an armed insurrection. This looks like an organized coup against the government in Kiev. These are actual scenes from the Ukrainian capital taken overnight. The pictures show protesters running amok, angry over plans for laws they say are aimed at punishing them for holding rallies. During the night, anti-government protesters lay siege to an exhibition center near Independence Square. This morning, Kiev awoke to the sound of gunfire. Protesters behind homemade shields walking into live fire. They're using snipers too with high-velocity rifles, firing from positions among the trees. We could see armed police retreating from their front line in the main square. There have been reports of medics being deliberately targeted. The clashes lasted for hours and led to deaths on both sides. The protesters are running their wounded back on stretchers. They were gunned down mercilessly. Who 
were these gunmen who fired on both police and protesters in the Maidan? What does the evidence suggest? What is the truth? For many months, the remains of the battle lay scattered throughout the Maidan. Some of it still remains to this day. But alongside the barricades, stacks of tires and rusted shields are the scars of battle, the painful memories of those who lost their lives. along with many questions that linger of who was responsible. In any effort to answer some of these questions, we have to go back to the beginning. Kiev, when we arrived in Kiev with the first team on the 23rd of November 2013, when we arrived, the rallies were somehow still non-aggressive. You could mix with people, talk to them. At all of the briefings before the active duty, we were told by our CO that the main task was to keep in the ranks, not to yield to provocations, withstand the pressure of, let's say, crowd who were in front of us. From the start, we explicitly forbade any use of firearms. We understood what it would result in. It was not possible to control who had and did not have firearms, but all self-defense forces, all leaders had strict directives. If you see a firearm anywhere, it must be taken out of Maidan at once. Our unit was only tasked with keeping public order. There was no other. Myself, as communications officer, I was only equipped with protective gear, bulletproof vest, elbow pads, helmet, and radio. We also carried rubber bullet guns. We all hoped it would be resolved peacefully. The longer we stayed, the worse it got, the more aggressive people became. They started using pepper spray on us. Use baseball bats and chains. From the opposing side, they were throwing Molotov cocktails, other stuff, fireworks, all the time. The obelisk, it all started right here. I came here on the 19th, early morning, because on the 18th, I saw what was happening and clearly understood that my place was here to help people. I couldn't just sit at home and watch it. My name is Alexander. At the Maidan, they know me as Sasha Khan. I was here from the 1st of December through the 22nd. On the 19th, I was by the Maidan obelisk. From the building of the conservatory, the second floor, and the roof, three men took positions. They had firearms in their hands. It looked like a shotgun. На внешний вид это были, значит, охотничье ружье. Того места, где я находился. From where I was, I could hear quite clear Mr. Lusenko yelling on stage that was Krushatik. In the morning, you will have something to fight the police with. Утром у вас будет то, 
чем вы сможете бороться с милицией. If they throw special forces against us, armed with live ammunition, the people will defend themselves, and they will get the means of defense in the police barracks. So they started taking positions on the left side of the conservatory on the second floor. So they put the first searchlight alongside. There's a space in between the floors. They put another light and another. So the right sector, you could see that. They had armbands, took the floors, the second and the third. They put shields in the balconies. In the evening, they put up searchlights because there was no light. There were three searchlights in the balcony. We were sitting with the guys and I said, look guys, this is bad. It's a very good sniper position. Mr. Lutsenko was shouting in the square that they would have something to fight us. And in the morning they started shooting at us. The shooting started at 5.30 in the morning. I got the information. They contacted me that we need to change radios. They were running out of juice. With my partner, we went down to the street, to Independence Square. We were changing radios. I headed to the shopping mall Globus, where we had an improvised barricade there. Well, I probably was about 50 meters away from there when my colleague walking beside me got shot in the arm. Well, I didn't see the shooter. The searchlights were shining into our eyes. It was about 100 meters from us to the building. When I got behind the barricade, I realized that I also was shot. And the shooter, he was doing it quite professionally, because I was hit literally 30 seconds after my partner. The morning of the 20th of February started for me about 7.30. I ran home for a few hours to sleep, and my phone rings, and I see that it is the commander of the Dnipropetrovsk, Berkut. Ми обмінялися з ним телефоном двома тижнями раніше. Я чергував вночі на вулиці Грушевського і на Майдані, і я зайшов на іншу сторону, розшукав старшого і кажу, давай обміняємося телефоном, що якщо до тебе прилетить якийсь випадковий камінь, що ви не починали стрільбу, і навпаки, що ми могли зняти провокації. He said, Andre, we have a problem. Because from the conservatory window, from the second floor, someone is shooting at my boys. And I already have 11 guys wounded. He says, do something. Because if you don't, they will open fire from our side. I was wounded on the 20th somewhere after 8 in the morning. At the time, I was, I think, between Globus and the Obelisk of Independence. When my friends took me on a stretcher to the ambulance, they said it was buckshot. So two pellets hit the lower part of my bulletproof vest and ricocheted into my back, and one pellet entered my side. And the Berkut commander keeps calling me and tells me, I already have 13 wounded. I have 15 wounded and one dead. And the Perubi yells into my phone that he sent his best men and they're running around the whole conservatory looking for those people, but can't find anybody. I suspect that they shot at us from the conservatory building. Then I get the call from Andre, the Berkut commander, and he says, I already have two dead. We're pulling our people back, and I don't know what will happen now. I personally carried our men to the top of the Institutska street with gunshot wounds. We retreated to the top of the Institutska, loaded our buses, and made a decision to leave the place, the central part of the city. 
Я в цей момент уже там гарячково. I at this moment in a hurry putting on my pants, coat and bulletproof vest to run to Maidan, turn on the TV and see Channel 5 live. Maidan attacking. Maidan is on the offensive. It was I think at that moment when our first line of our defense saw Berkut retreating up the hill. And I think it was a spontaneous decision of the people to rush after them. After Berkut. One guy turns to us and says, why are we all standing here? Let's move forward. We all look at him. Maybe we shouldn't. He kicks some piece of wood out of a barricade and we all rush after him. In a wave, we went and got to the obelisk and started a mop-up operation. At that moment at the top, I saw those officers. They say now they were maybe SWAT or something. They were in gray uniforms with yellow armbands. They opened fire. Of course I saw. Where? They were shooting at people. Right above us are standing these men with armbands and shoot at the ground at our feet. At that moment, they were shooting at the ground near us. So what you see in those videos, when that group retreats, the sniper goes prone. You could clearly see the sniper didn't make a single shot. Same with the law enforcement officers. They didn't shoot at people. They shot at the ground. They shot at safe sectors to try, with their weapons, to stop the crowd. So they wouldn't advance. We clearly understood if we take just a few steps back, they will overrun us, they will just crush us there. And because of those thoughts, when you understand that you can't go back, you move forward. I ran out of there to here. There was this group of guys, I turned around with my shield, squatted. When I got the first bullet, I got up. Turned around, I got the second bullet, my lower back. When I got further down, I was hit by the third bullet. We saw the snipers a little further when we lost sight of the Berkut, all those people with the armbands. We understood when the bullets started hitting us in the heart, in the head, in the eye. It was clear then that they were not just shooting. I ran, got hit in the neck, my finger was shot, then in the lower back, so to speak. Judging by the bullets, it was a Kalashnikov. And judging by trajectory, by my wounds, by the place where I was, they were shooting from the intersection of the Bankova and the Institutska. No, I didn't have time. I was watching the wounded who needed help, who needed to be carried out. And the bullets? There were people killed with wounds in the front. Where else could they be shooting from? It all happened between 8 and 9, somewhere before 9 in the morning. So it all happened within an hour. And when I got to Maidan, ran to the stage, I was told, Andre, we have a lot of people dead. Near the Kaczynski Hotel, we have 11 bodies. At that moment, a sniper shoots this medic girl in the neck, and it was a long distance back from the stage. And at that moment, a sniper kills one more protester, right there, at the far end of Maidan, near the Kaczynski Hotel, at the beginning, of Mihailovskab Street. We understood that we needed to evacuate people somehow. The unit you were talking about was on the roof of the Cabinet of Ministers, on the upper floors of the Cabinet of Ministers. Its task was surveillance. No, they didn't shoot from Ukraine. I heard it many times, but let me tell you, we were sitting here, a big group of people, here and here. You have to be completely inept sniper not to kill everybody here. Mm. 
Мы сейчас уже можем. We can tell now that they were shot from the Ukraine hotel 100%. Even those videos on the internet, for example, that bright flash, a shot, and a protester is hit, another flash. It's a shot made from the Ukraine hotel, for sure. Это выстрел произведенный со стороны Украины. Here is an ideal sector of fire from Bankova Street, because there is a hill here. Here, the guys were all up in the hill and all got nicked. And all those that were lower, they were all okay, not even wounded. It is clear. If they had been shooting from the Ukraina, they would have all been dead here. I would have been dead for sure. And another thing, there are bullet hits in the trees that show that the shot came directly from the third or fourth floor of the Ukraine hotel. As we shine a laser pointer through the bullet holes in the tree, they do indeed point to the third and fourth floor windows of the Hotel Ukraine. Judging by the wounds, the bullets went right through. They went through the tissue, leaving a thin channel. It means the shot came from a very short distance. That is, the bullet had a lot of energy. So it was fired from a distance of no more than 200-300 meters. It is a real firefight. The officer you see peeking from behind the barricade in the video, he is defending. He is being attacked. He is being shot at. At that moment, he has no time to think whether it is the attacker that's shooting at him or some bad guy from the Ukraine hotel. The direction is 100% the same. It is clear that both protesters and police were being fired upon. But who was shooting who, and from where? Myself, I didn't see any, because we came on the 19th and on the 20th. I didn't see any weapons. There were no weapons on Institutska. I assure you, none of those who were coming up the street here had any firearms. Nothing, just shields, metal, wood, all kinds. None of us had any weapons. Я увидел одного парня с снайперской винтовкой у нас. У него такая старенькая снайперская винтовка. I saw this guy with a sniper rifle. He had this old, old rifle, a hunting rifle, maybe. Обязательно подстрелить. And I realized that if he goes forward, he would be shot for sure. So four of us, myself, three other guys with shields, went with him. We were covering him so that we could hide his rifle. So we moved forward and forward, and I remember how he squatted down, all four of us. Two of us were covering him from above, myself, and another guy as tall as me. It was easier for us. So we four stood there. He pushed the barrel between the shields. I squatted a bit, and I say, quick. And he says, don't distract me. Quicker, I beg you. Wait. Then click. He fired. He looked through the optics and said, that's it. Got him. There's no shortage of varying stories and opinions. But one thing has become more evident. There were more guns on the Maidan than previously believed. In our investigation, we contacted Ben Tiza, an expert in both sniper and combat training, whose credentials include over 40 years serving with both the military and the FBI. Actually, identifying who were the individuals that were engaging the um, innocent people on the ground, the actual snipers that were doing a shoot, it would take some investigative skills or procedures, one of which would be looking and reviewing any or all videotape of any of the buildings at the time the shots were made, any of the victims and any autopsy or fragments of bullets, um, positions of, of the logical positions where follow-up investigators or police officers went to to see if they could find any remnants of the presence of a sniper like casings, uh, positions where the weapon might have been set up, personal things left behind by accident or by haste because it had to leave. Investigative work should have been done right afterwards. Uh, a number of months have passed, and that means the crime scene or where the shooting position is 
deteriorated or been compromised by other people. Because of the passage of time now, a lot of our hard evidence is, is being um, diminished. As our investigation continued, we hired forensic specialist Michael Knox, an expert in crime scene reconstruction, as we sift through countless hours of video footage, searching for clues to the shooter's identity. The main area that I've been focusing on is this section of Institutska Street, which is where the Ukraine Hotel is, near the October Palace, and up to about the Arcata Bank building. And what we got from that is video that actually shows fairly close up of several people being shot. And that's important because in a reconstruction, what we want to be able to do is see good close up video where we can actually identify at the point when the person actually is shot, when the bullet strikes, and then also have the audio that's associated with that so that we can do some calculations as to distance. this particular shooting here where he reacts and begins to fall. If you slow the video down and you look at it frame by frame, actually right on that frame there as we step from one frame to the other, the back part of his jacket, there's noticeable movement. That is movement of the jacket that's caused by the shock wave surrounding the bullet. That tells you the exact instant of when he is struck with a bullet. And we see in the frames immediately following that, his right arm begins to come up, and we actually see him visibly reacting to being shot, and then he begins to drop. So what I've done is mark right here, based on the time code, that's the instant when the video shows the bullet striking him. Then we see this instant, which is 242 milliseconds later, is when we actually see the profile for the shockwave of the bullet. What we have here is a bullet that's traveling faster than the speed of sound, so that the, the bullet will reach its target before the sound that it makes reaches its target. Uh, in this case, what we're gonna see is that the bullet strikes him, and then the sound reaches the camera, which is not right where he is. The camera's further down from where the, the shot was fired. And then we also see another shock wave, then get the profile of the, the report of the rifle, the sound that the rifle actually made at the time that it was discharged. When he's shot, the bullet is hitting him from a little bit to his right, and he's facing a little bit left of that architectural feature. Now that feature is on a building that's over here in the background that's across the street from the National Bank. And after locating that building, then I can trace a line back from there to the area where he was when he was shot, and that gives you the direction from which the shot was fired. One of the things you can see in, in some of the frames of this video, there's a line here of police that are in their dark uniforms that in the frame looks like they're fairly close, but they're actually several hundred feet away. When we take our distance calculation, couple that with the direction that we've determined based upon the video, then that puts the shooter right about this location here, which is where those police officers are. So that would indicate that that shot actually came from the area where they're occupying. Uh, the line of fire, could it have been from a building in that direction? It, it could be from um, something else in that direction, but distance-wise, though, it comes back to about where they are. There's one shot in particular that would be consistent with somebody shooting from a higher elevation. We see what actually looks like smoke but that this is actually the bullet passing through him. What happens is that the bullet, because of the energy that it has, it's, it's carrying with it blood, tissue, fabric that are actually vaporized, and, and that's why we have this appearance. The very next frame, we see the second fragment hit, and it actually forms a line across the tree. This actually goes from no bullet to the next frame, being struck, then to the next frame, being struck with the, the second fragment of it. And then as he uh, begins to fall, the shield comes around and we see the, where the two bullets pass through the shield. And, and if we go back in the video prior to that shot occurring and look at the uh, shield, there's, those two bullet marks are not there. So that's, those are both from this particular shot. But what we see with this, if we were to, to basically take a straight line and bring it back, and it would, would meet the sidewalk 
just outside of the frame of the video. This particular person is elevated up at a higher position, shooting downward, and because of the drop of the bullet as it travels, it strikes the, the sidewalk ahead of him and ricochets and then actually strikes uh, him after it's ricocheted. What are some of the possible locations that shooter could have been? The man that gets hit is right behind these other individuals, and here's a wall. Well, this wall is visible in the aerial photograph right here. So they're positioned right behind the wall at this location. And we look across the street and across the sidewalk, we're coming back to the location of these several buildings in, in here. One thing that we know about ricochet is that the angle that it comes up is less than the angle at which it actually struck. So we know then that if it's traveling at this particular angle, that the bullet has to have come from a higher angle when it hit. And again, most likely from one of these buildings in this area. The um, individuals who are actually doing the shooting obviously can come from any one of a couple of categories. They could be police officers who've been ordered to do it. They could be military. There's the word used for mercenaries or contractors who are readily available in any country, in any location. It could be someone who's just hired to shoot people. And there's people that can be hired to do that. Uh, and they may say, here, um, no one knows who you are. Uh, no one knows what you're doing. This ammunition is not traceable. This rifle is not belonging to any of the law enforcement or military unit. We want you to go in there and shoot as many people as you can, and we'll pay $2,000, $3,000, $5,000. Once you get in, we'll get you out of the country, and you're gone, and off you go. So I can hire someone to do it. And they can be hired for their sniping skills or the willingness to go in and engage and commit murder against innocent people. Once they're done, they would depart, and there's no association with any established unit, no association with any established government. They're just in and out, and they're hired by somebody. The capability of that is very easy, very agreeable, and has been done in the past and probably will still be done in the future. As to specific units, it's a secret. There's no really exposure of any of those recently that I'm aware of, but it is something that's extremely difficult to gain that information because of the degree of secrecy is sound associated with contracting with people like that. To fully understand the capabilities of a professional sniper, we hired one ourselves. Former elite Soviet Spetsnaz sniper, Marko Vorobiev. What we're going to try to do is we try to simulate uh, some of the conditions that were present in uh, February 20th in Kiev. The ranges there were approximately 100 to 300 meters or so. That's where the majority of the uh, people in the kill zone were, and a lot of the hits happened. We don't have the urban setting right here, but a lot of the shots are happening from the uh, buildings that surrounded that area. So we could demonstrate here the elevation which we have, and we can also simulate the distance to the target. With the aluminum shield representing the shields that the protesters were using, the steel pots uh, that the most of them were wearing that day, and of course to represent the head, we used uh, a honeydews. We would also be using a piece of 12-inch tree trunk show what happens when the bullet actually uh, hits it. As we can see that the shield didn't make any difference. The steel core bullets as well as the lead core bullets went right through it, inflicting damage on the, whatever was behind the shield. The next thing was a steel pot helmet. And most of the protesters were wearing, you could see a nice round entry hole, but there's no exit hole. And our uh, little 12 inch diameter stump, it didn't even slow down as it exited, creating this huge uh, exit hole. And then we have uh, two commercially available bullets firing. Both of those also exited. One right here and one right here. In my opinion, the professional sniper would shoot for the center mass, the center of the body. He would not shoot 
you know, in the head, especially from anything past 100 yards or so. So it's just not feasible. That's number one. Number two, uh, the shots that we've witnessed on the news footage were fired into clumps of people into the group. You don't have to be a sniper to do that. I'm thinking they were probably more of a, um, just the regular shooters shooting like a AK type guns or something like that. The word sniper is being uh, heavily misused by people. Every time there's a shooter, they would say, oh, there's a sniper. The sniper rifle is equipped with the optical sights, right? So which basically uh, is a sighting implement that allows you to bring the image closer so you can aim more accurately. So to miss the, the group of people slowly creeping and then they hit the tree, almost impossible, even with the full power scope of three and a half power. And quite honestly, there's, <laughs> there are plenty of people in Ukraine who would shoot at each other anyway. History based, ethnically based, uh, religiously, religious reasons, um, you name it, just about everything. So I think it was most likely somebody uh, local that did that. This footage was shown repeatedly on several networks as evidence of snipers firing from Hotel Ukraine into the Maidan. Could this footage be revealing the identities of the ones who were shooting at either the protesters or police? Most people who, if you look at them in some of the videotapes, they have rifles or are not trained. Their presence is evident. They don't know how to hold a rifle. Uh, they don't know how to look for it. You can just tell by their mechanism of, and their mechanics that they really don't know how to use the rifle as a sniper. As far as that individual in a room, uh, if he was a sniper and he was killing protesters, logically he wouldn't look at the camera and identify himself. Most snipers who are going to commit homicide or murder wouldn't look at a camera and say, look at me, I'm the great guy. Uh, the way he handled the rifle, other than pointing out the window and pull the trigger, and he had no idea what he was shooting at. There's no scope on it. He, the part of it was holding the scope over, sitting in a chair. And so he was play acting, and he's play acting like he had a real rifle, what appeared to be, in my, in my opinion, a pellet gun. That we can. So it's somewhat illogical to claim that that is actually a sniper shooting at first, because it really wasn't. Remember, a sniper's job is not to be seen. A sniper's job is to engage as many targets as necessary and not be compromised and then be able to get out and extract. And so therefore, the equipment they may have, if we ever got a picture of the rifles and what they look like, because these are professional equipment, some of the rifles we saw in the videotape are just basic rifles with a scope on it, not necessarily quality rifles or quality scopes. So generally speaking, the way it was done, the lack of any evidence, the lack of any presence, the lack of any snipers being spotted, both shooting or extraction, I would say you have professional snipers or well-trained snipers who, who know what they're doing and know how to engage, disengage, and disappear. One of the things that you have to consider when you're seeing is that when the police are operating within their legal authority, they, they're operating out in public. They're not hiding, trying to keep people from seeing what's going on. And that's what's happening here. You have police that are trying to control basically a, a riot situation and, and really a very severe one. But people who are doing stuff subversively are not operating out in the open. They're operating in, in hiding. They're hiding behind trees. They're hiding inside buildings. They're hiding in places where people aren't going to see them. And so we don't get a lot of video of that. We don't have witnesses to that. We don't have things uh, you know, that, that are catching people's attention because there's so much out there in the open that has uh, people's attention. So when you look at this video footage and you see evidence that the police are shooting or that they've done things, that doesn't mean that nobody else is. It doesn't mean that, that they're the only ones shooting and that they're responsible for all of this. There's indicators and there's somebody else firing from a position that is not consistent with the lines that the police were holding. I'm not sure it was Burkut. Um, not a single one of our officers would go on a mission dressed in a uniform and civilian shoes. Besides, I saw our Burkut guys. They have a different uniform, different insignia. Who those guys were, I can't tell you. I don't know. 
The Black 100, the Burkut officers that were there, did not shoot at civilians, at protesters. This is probably 150%. The bullet I took out myself, I held it in the palm of my hand, and it was foreign-made, lead in a copper jacket. They don't produce them here. It's an imported bullet. Foreign snipers, I believe, were there. Why? Because, as Kievians say, the Kiev Burkut officers, they detained three persons, three shooters. One was a woman. They were citizens of Baltic states. They were detained with Remington rifles. One of them was a woman. They were transferred to the state security forces. This is all based on what the Kiev Burkut officers told us. Where are they now and why the media pays no attention is a different question. There is another version that they were Yanukovych's people. We know now that they were not only Burkut, not only the state security forces, Ukraine security service, that there were people hired in hunting clubs, commercial and so on. So they could have been Yanukovych's people who tried in that way to provoke protesters. On the other hand, it's entirely possible that there was a third party, so we need to investigate if there was a third party, I think. That could have been Russia or somebody else. That, that window facing directly to us. Yeah. Fuck! Okay, get the fuck out of here. Okay, one, two, three, four, fifth row from the left, second from the top, one that was open. Well, I don't think he fired at us, actually. And it might, who knows who, which side it was. Uh, snipers, when they um, take a position, have the mission profile in mind, that is to engage and observe and not be compromised. But they also have a second issue. How am I going to get out of here? Because they can't stay there. That means somewhere in all that chaos, all the things that were going on down there, these snipers and their sniper rifles left the scene and disappeared. There was a fact that Mr. Pashinsky took away weapons, helped in removing weapons to some third party. I'm not familiar with that episode at all. Хочу нагадати, що Генеральною прокуратурою, Головним слідчим управлінням Генеральної I want to remind you that the General Prosecutor's Office is investigating the criminal case of the premeditated murder of 76 people in Maidan Square. Today, 12 members of the riot police unit, Burkut, are under arrest. Three of them are officially charged. This case is connected to the behavior of the members of the Burkut unit during the mass murder of civilians. In Institutska Street, near October Palace, this unit was under command of Major Dmitry Sadovnik, who was arrested now. In fact, the whole case against Sadovnik is based on assumptions. Not on evidence, but on assumptions. Dmitry says that the whole time he has been in jail, no investigation has been conducted. He repeatedly stated that he wants to cooperate with the investigators and that he has valuable information. They simply don't want it. 
What did Avakov or Manitsky say? They just made accusations based on unverified information, based on assumptions, not facts. We have identified all individuals participating in that operation. They are not looking for any other persons connected to these tragic events. On the other hand, based on media reports and video, we can say that many other units were deployed in that area along the Berkut. There are special units Alpha and Omega, as well as internal troops. The investigators never determined who was actually shooting. In this situation, we established some facts. For example, after the ballistic analysis, we determined that one particular rifle was used to kill eight people. We are not going into more details because the presumption of innocence principle. I can clearly see that there is no proof of his guilt. Whether they will be obtained later, I don't know. As a defense lawyer, I've been collecting the evidence, and the closer to the end, the clearer it becomes that Dmitry is innocent. Those professional officers take an oath of office to protect the public, and not kill them. Uh, and they take an oath of office to do whatever they can to preserve the peace and engage any threats. And they will be accountable by the government and by their agency for those acts. And it would be pretty evident they were doing it because they're in plain view. I mean, versus everything, uniform officers are, are in plain view. And the accusation that they were the ones doing the sniping uh, is easily dispelled by the fact because their own officers were being killed by some of these snipers. And their first thing job is to protect themselves so they can protect the citizens. And so for their primary concern and their oath of office and their dedication to profession um, would dispel, at least in my mind, in my opinion, that they would be the ones perpetrating the, quote, hidden sniper shots. The thing is, is I didn't see the bullet myself. It's because my artery was cut by the bullet and they extracted it in the hospital. I was under general anesthesia and came back in the room. When I asked the surgeon what bullet it was, where it is, he just smiled and said, what bullet? After we got to the hospital, an investigative unit arrived. We wrote our reports concerning our gunshot wounds. They collected our jackets and our sweaters. They also took my bullet. When I was in Kiev in the hospital there, there was no investigation. The buckshot they extracted from me in the hospital is still at my house. Nobody did anything about it. We were talking about the Berkut units on the side of the October Palace with the yellow armbands. They had firearms that were issued to them. The details of that order are under investigation, and it's a matter of separate conversation. They say that the police use firearms. Not a single officer, at least from our battalion, had a firearm. If you check Article 15 of the Ukrainian Code about police, it says that a police officer has the right to use a firearm when there is a direct threat to his life. Was there a direct threat? There was. But as I remember, our commander, Andrei Kachenko, guys, even if you just pull out your bully stick, consider yourself dismissed from the Berkut and demoted to traffic police. I think that was an order from above. At the moment, we have information that they possess firearms. What they're most likely to have is shotguns. But as you know, you can load those guns with anything you want. Especially bearing in mind that Vitaly Lutsenko, the interior minister, spoke for the opposition and called on everyone to bring any weapons they have to start bloodshed here. 
They want to seize power and create a new state. Did Manitsky and Avakov mention the third party too? So they shouldn't look for the police officers that are easy to reach, but for the third party, which is probably difficult, maybe impossible to reach. They did shoot at us from the conservatory, and the night before the right sector had been there. So you make a conclusion. They said they didn't find any strangers there. There were no strangers there. I suspect that it was the same force shooting at both sides. It was important for someone to heat up the situation. At such a distance, you can only work with sniper rifles. This is pretty clear. What kind of rifles, I don't know. But it was clear that they were sniper rifles. Because a man would run, then a shot, and the man goes down, and his helmet would explode. That's what I saw. I'm not sure they will finish their investigation. They will just conveniently forget it. I think they are looking for scapegoats, and these scapegoats are the Kiev Berkut. We will never know who shot here either. There will be theories. They'll find somebody to blame. They will even order somebody to be a scapegoat and convict them. But he will just be a pawn. I suspect that we'll never find out who gave the order. Somehow nobody's looking for the shooters from Maidan. Who do you think would benefit from snipers shooting at unarmed civilians? I think Russia. They just need to blame someone. They need to find somebody to blame for what happened. That's been their policy all along. Unless someone actually becomes an informant or confesses um, or were made aware of it by you know, some other security breach in some file or something like that, it would be very difficult. Imagine a scenario where you have a large crowd of people armed with various types of weapons advancing on the U.S. Capitol. How would the U.S. Capitol Police respond? They wouldn't allow that to go on for months. There's a certain point where if we have to protect this building, we have to protect the U.S. Capitol, for example, then you have to draw a line. Once people cross that line, then you have to stop them by whatever means is required to stop them. Here, even though there's a number of police officers, there's very large crowds, and by all uh, appearances in the video, the crowds well outnumber the police. You've got this crowd advancing, you've got violence that's already in play, uh, you have uh, firearms and shootings that are taking place that could be coming from all different directions, and you're in a very crowded urban setting. It's difficult to control because you have potential dangers coming from all around you. We stand with the people of Ukraine in their search for justice, human dignity, security, a return to economic health, and for the European future they have chosen and that they deserve. I returned to Ukraine for my third visit in five weeks last Tuesday in support of these very goals. Then, halfway through our visit, in the wee hours of Wednesday, December 10th, we witnessed the appalling show of force by government forces who turned riot police, bulldozers, and tear gas on the Maidan demonstrators as they sang hymns and prayed for peace. Ukrainians of all ages and backgrounds flooded to the Maidan to protect it. Secretary Kerry wasted no time in expressing the United States' disgust at this decision of the Ukrainian government, and by morning the riot police had been forced to retreat. You only have to be on the Maidan to feel the energy, to feel the hope of Ukrainians coursing through the center of Kyiv and across the country. 
people of all ages, of all classes, of all walks of life are taking ownership of their future and coming out into the streets to demand a European future. They're doing so peacefully, with great courage, and with enormous personal restraint.